All right, let's, we're going to start now because we have a, a very rich afternoon following a, you know, a wonderful, wonderfully interesting um, morning, and so we can also build on that. Uh, my name is Victoria de Grazia, and I'm here, uh, a professor emeritus, two years, um, as a colleague of uh, Istvan, but I'm also here as a student insofar as I was at Columbia starting in 1970 who never took a course with Ishtaban and never even met Ishtaban <laughs> while I was here, okay? And I thought that that doubleness might um, be, be interesting in reflecting on Ishtaban, but also on the um, institution in which um, we worked, but also in, in the times. So I had to, you know, uh, pro apologia, why, why didn't I take a class with this person who we know, who is just, just marvelous, scintillating, warm, human, clearly we got so many people through, uh, and, and was, was just so fruitful in terms of his, uh, his collegial relations, which is what I saw him after I came back to Columbia in 1995. And I was thinking, well, you know, it was the Cold War, 1970s. I can remember a work by uh, a Polish-American, Anton Deport from 1979. I think it's called Europe Between the Superpowers or the Balance of Power. And basically said it's all for the best that Europe is divided uh, forever. That was the sort of understanding or for a good long time after it made such a mess of things in 1945. And of course, saying that Europe should be divided uh, as right meant that basically there was no such thing as Central Europe. And I, uh, for one, you know, <laughs> running, if you want, with the hounds rather than the hares, was going uh, you know, for big power. And big power uh, in, in those days when I was studying meant uh, oh, Germany uh, and the old Germany, um, the, the France, uh, bringing in Britain uh, comparatively, and Italy, and Italy. And since I was very interested in Italy, I was trying to hold up you know, that Italy still as a a lesser of the great powers. But that meant I had zero interest in Central Europe. It just created problems, and that was always the idea. You know, Poland always creating problems. Hungary creates problems. Uh, and But who doesn't create problems? Well, the Soviet Union, it creates order, because that was kind of the uh, way we were being taught it by those who are much you know, in, into a kind of realist uh, international relations. Um, uh, or, you know, sort of bound up like my own uh, mentor, um, Fritz Stern, I was, Arno Mayer was teaching then, you know, this kind of Germanic Weltschmerz, which basically had Istvan teaching Central European history, while the students, because also linguistically, uh, and also because of their power interests, radical classes, uh, were very much uh, not interested in Central Europe. How could you possibly study Central Europe if you were interested in revolution? Uh, or uh, also in fascism, it wasn't. It didn't even have the status of having you know, real fascists at that point. They were it was derivative fascism. It was all derivative. Okay, <laughs> these were the times, folks. These were the times. Okay, so uh, you know, to, to access uh, Ishtaban required you know, courage and um, it, 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 the fact too that he wasn't. Um, he was teaching more German, uh, not German history, but rather Central Euro European history. Okay, um, later, let's say later, coming back, it was such a different time. And it, what Ishvan was the same, of course, three decades uh, later, but hey, the wall had fallen, and now Central Europe, Eastern Europe, the Europe in between, that dark place which we imagined it to be uh, in around 1970, was alive and hopping. And it wasn't just alive and hopping so that Ishvan was riding a tide. He was part of the Renaissance. And that, it's amazing. Just as he's retiring at the end of the 90s, he's part of a Renaissance of uh, uh, you know, connecting so in such a grassroots way uh, with uh, historians of uh, East Central 
Europe, and then connecting with this big famished class, or the class of, what is it, 1999, which is coming in, who are very adventurous also in getting the new languages uh, that would be required to study um, Eastern Europe. So not just the German, which you know people had more or less, uh, or French, which was common. And he emerged also because the older guard was retiring. And so Fritz Stern, uh, I believe in 1998, and then um, Robert Paxton uh, and Isser Wallach, who are the stalwarts of a, kind of, are a very strong European uh, program. And Istvan began to take on roles uh, that he could not have had before, uh, and that he wanted to take on, and that he could take on because he had a, vi a vision of Europe, okay, a very different Europe. <laughs> Uh, and uh, one that was extremely appropriate for the time. So I think of these, not just his own um, histories, but these very important edited volumes, which we tend to underestimate as where he's tying into, you know, I just think of Tony Jutt, who was nearby, but that was a very important figure. And Ishvan was very important for Tony's uh, understanding of Eastern uh, Europe, but many, many, many others. So he became such an important figure, okay, even though you know, he was retiring right, in now creating a whole generation. And that is just remarkable. I have to say, it was, you know, I began to work with him. He was incredibly generous, you know, so you could count on him to come and speak about a film. I remember him speaking about Katkin. The Vajja film in 2000, I think, seven. And um, it was remarkable. It was remarkable. You know, it's a movie that I mean, very, all of its ambiguities, but it's also its nationalism that lends itself to all kinds of equivocation. Ishtvan, in front of students who had not even been aware of the controversies, it wasn't, it was even handed. I mean, again, that, you know, the extraordinary capacity. To, to deal with the paradox and the kind of awfulness that so the students came away with a sense of the horribleness, the monstrosity of it, um, and you know, the pox on both their houses, the Nazis and, 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 and the Soviets, uh, but, but also um, with, with a very deep sense of, of history and the capacity also to continue to think <clears throat> about it, even though it was so uh, atrocious. He was very important, I'm not sure if uh, Volker Berghahn is here right now, he'll be coming back, in uh, bring, starting to bring over you know, both, you know, Eastern Europe I mean, people from Hungary, and that was just wonderful. And that was hugely thanks to his very good friend, uh, Lasso Bito. Um, Olivia is, is here. She can remember the battles. The true story there was Lasso Bito was among his many other qualities as, as a thinker, um, as a... Uh, a, 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 a writer, as a lover of music, what, uh, he was also a, a, um, a, a scientist and an inventor who uh, had invented this cure uh, for glaucoma, okay, which uh, on which he had the patent, and the patent was actually commercialized because he commercialized it. I think the Swedes got the first monopoly on it, and it generated millions and millions of dollars, which was supposed to go to endowing not just a visiting professorship, but a huge, you know, endowed chair. You know, we, we, we I mean, you know, we imagined it. You know, Istvan, a gold chair, and you know, it was medals and so on and so forth, uh, and many scholars around him and people coming and going from all over, not just Western Europe, but you know, widely understood including, you know, the, the new uh, states coming out of uh, Yugoslavia. Unfortunately, Colombia being Colombia, even though we went, we had very interesting meetings with provosts and treasurers and so on. Colombia keeps all the patent monies. And so this little dribble, which was very, very useful because uh, Istvan empowered that money. He made it grow and grow so that anybody was coming, anybody, <laughs> okay, Shavish and, and, and um, Attila, uh, really had an expanded world to come into. So I think I was kind of concluding, concluding thinking, gosh, mm, I got very confused thinking about this metaphor. So I said, Jesus, Van Nouvelle, well, I missed it. That's the way it is. And I said, well, and then a grand tokai, you know, grand cru, you know, the, the drink of kings, and that's that's Ishtavan, that's Ishtavan. And as I was thinking, I said, gosh, the last time he came for dinner, he brought me a Tokai, which he suggested was extremely precious. 2005, this was probably 2016. I said, 
I never drank it because he suggested it was so precious, I was going to save it maybe for him to come back. And so I ran over to the liquor closet, which was not really a closet, sort of set of drawers, and I look in, and there it was, but some rat <laughs> had drunk it. I don't know who. <laughs> leaving, okay, leaving this, okay. I said, well, you know, clearly I'm not going to offer this to for you to drink, but I did think, you know, it's kind of Catholic, reliquary, <laughs> wine, and all that. I did think I'm just going to say some of that. Hey, let's post, post this story. Post, post Gloria, to post Ava, toast of all of you for being here. Uh, toast you, Olivia, because you contributed so much through, through Oslo. And on with the show. Let me um, introduce. I'm not going to. The other side of me. Um, let me introduce. Um, now this is going to make me very ambiguous, ambivalent. Let me introduce um, uh, Dominique Kirshnerrod. <laughs> all right, who, when the class of famous class of 1999, um, one of the very successful class, uh, who was my student. <laughs> but she got where the way the winds were blowing and wanted to run with the hounds. And it, she you know, did it, it started with this wonderful work on the Adriatic, which required the languages of the Adriatic, which are multiple, not just the Italian, and the German, and you know, French, who were always sniffing around about what the Italians were doing. And uh, so the first book on which was just up uh, Istvan's you know, cup of tea, you know, bitter, perverse, uh, nationalism, uh, uh, nationalist, na nationalist who hated the nation. Feared, okay. feared. Who feared it, hated it, if that's me. Editing it. Um, and then he's gone on to write The Crisis of Fiume, and you know, part of this, this, this generation then that began to, to move around and to introduce me to a whole different shape of Europe. So take it from here. Oh. Thank you so much. Yeah? Can does it work? Um, I'm not going to speak very long because I've been writing about Ishvan a little bit this year. <laughs> so, um, and I, I, something really strange has been happening with my brain. I keep on having this memory of talking with Ishvan and Gloria in their living room. And Ishvan and Gloria love to watch movies together. And they, when, they like, when they like something, they watch it over and over and over again. And one of their favorites was that uh, BBC series, Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. <laughs> and they had just rewatched it. And uh, Ishvan said, we love it so much. I'm like, I love it too. I've watched it a thousand times. And he said, no. It's, there's this one scene that is total perfection. She sees the house, the mansion she could have had. She looks out the window, and you hear her say, all of this could have been mine. And then in the next scene, she's standing behind the, 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 the sister playing piano, and she looks across the room with smoldering eyes, at her Heathcliff, not I'm not, but at, at, the, at the man who could have made it all hers. And that's all you needed. And I said, yeah, but you know, don't you think this is love? <laughs> he just said, <laughs> oh, Dominique. Now, <laughs> Ishan loved to ruin my love stories. He loved, loved, loved. To, to, we've heard this now over and over and over again, as Holly and Mate's piece said, the paradoxes. Um, he loved the details, as Alice and Frank Johnson mentioned. Um, but what he, he honestly loved was human beings being human in those structures. 
And I think that our friendship built out of that because I am a really silly human being and I do really weird things like wear wigs and show up on the wrong day with my luggage and say, well, we can have a party anyways. And he loved it. He loved how silly I was, but still could get so angry about history. And our friendship was based on that. It was based on being silly in the structure of making great work. The great work is, the, is these historians here at this table, which is what, something else that made him really happy. What made him happy were these books all these people in this room have written. He loved them. He loved them. He showed them off the way Franz Ferdinand probably showed off those skulls. <laughs> and I think he probably had more fun in looking at them than the hunters. Uh, he loved creation. He loved good prose. But what he really cared about was that he was part of a family that created a space for human beings to be messy, complicated, silly, and ravenously evil all at the same time. And this is what our panel is about. It's about how Ishvan's work and, and scholarship modeling and teaching has helped change how we think about Eastern Europe. That was also the theme of the special issue we keep on mentioning. We, we have some people here who wrote for that special issue and other people in the audience. A lot of other people in the special issue wanted to be here. They're in Montreal right now at a German Studies Association. Many of them giving discussions almost precisely like these today about this new turn in Eastern European history and how Ishvan's work affected that. And we will be doing this in alphabetical order because I couldn't decide any other order, so the alphabet is doing it for us. Our first speaker is Gavr Egri. He came all the way from Europe for this. Um, he is a historian, a doctor of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and director general of the Institute of Political History in Budapest. His research interests are nationalism, everyday ethnicity, politics of identity, and the politics of memory in modern East Central Europe. He's the author of five volumes in Hungarian and is the author of several articles in European Review of History, Slavic Review. I'm not going to list everything. <laughs> he was shortlisted for the Verbecki Prize of the Polish Historical Association. He was a Fulbright visiting research scholar at Stanford and has received um, fellowships, most importantly for me, at least, uh, in Jena, but also at the New York College, Bucharest, and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. I met Gabor because of his passion project that has taken over his life for the last, I don't know, seven years, five, seven, five, seven years, and that is um, the ERC uh, Nepostrans, Negotiating Post-Imperial Transitions from, re from Remobilization to Nation-State Consolidation, a comparative study of local and regional transitions in the post Habsburg East and Central Europe. I'm going to just add a little thing here. What Gabor has done with that ERC is, is I think, the model of all ERCs. He has helped scholars from all over the region develop projects, do the research, and train them in ways they were not trained in their home countries. And he has created almost a little university of his own. They've, the friendships and the collaborations that have grown out of that ERC are, are going to last. They have a running joke, that group, about how they're all going to be godparents to each other's children, regardless of religion. And I think that uh, not enough of us actually pay homage to what Gabor has done for our field. And I'm so proud to introduce him. Gabor, will you come talk? <laughs> Okay, so uh, I prepared a PPT that listening to this wonderful commemorative event, uh, I just decided to shed it. Would you close it? Uh, uh, I just this, so I prepared a PPT presentation, but listening to this wonderful commemorative event that uh, radiated to me so much about the community that was built around Istvan Dag and his uh, work. Uh, and his contribution to historical scholarship just made me shed it and talk a bit more general issues uh, that also benefited from the previous contributions because being at the last panel means that uh, many things I initially thought I will talk about 
were already mentioned, detailed, so therefore I can probably go a bit beyond uh, those topics. Uh, and I'm from, uh, from the generation of what was already mentioned, again, the grandchildrens of that. So I had a direct contact with Ishwam, but not as a student, uh, neither as someone who came to him regularly for advice, uh, but someone who was very much inspired by a range of scholars uh, who worked on 19th and 20th century uh, East Central Europe, uh, who constituted the dark school, the range of which I'm still not yet aware of. Every day I hear someone talking about uh, their relationship with Ishpan, I realize that, oh, again, someone whose work inspired me uh, was part of this Dayak school. Uh, and the first time I actually met Istvan, not as a person, but as an author, was uh, in graduate school when at a graduate seminar, I was told that it was, uh, that was about the Hungarian reform era and uh, the Hungarian revolution of 1848, I was told that, and there is a very interesting take from a Hungarian scholar from New York on it that's really good to read. Uh, and I just tried to get a copy of the Hungarian edition of the Lofo Revolution, read it, and it was uh, a very strange reading, uh, not just because of the prose that everyone uh, praised here, but also because it was eerily familiar and still different. So that, and that was practically a point that my teacher wanted to make. So it was somehow not deviating too much from the canon, but still I felt that it's not the same story I was told at the university. And then came my turn from economic history to, because that time I was interested in economic history, so it was really a kind of excursion, came my turn to uh, nationalism and the engagement with the Dayak school, and I won't list the name just to know that somehow uh, that was the moment when I realized how much actually I'm indebted to the scholar uh, like Istvan uh, To the journal volume, I contributed with an uh, essay on, uh, on the reception of the Lofu revolution in the Hungarian scholarship and the Hungarian public, which I consider a very interesting uh, issue, mostly because it also, uh, not just how much it somehow reflected this sense of mind that it is somehow canonical, most of the reviews try to make the point that, well, Istvan's book is wonderful, but the Hungarian scholarship is already there what, where he is, so he's uh, uh, showing the way and still somehow the Hungarian historiography is there. Uh, um, but also how it was managed to come to the public in a way that uh, was much more political. And probably it is something that, uh, I don't know how much he was aware of it, but definitely something that tells for us historians about why we should engage with the public and not let others use our historiographic, uh, historical work. So I don't want to simply repeat what I have contributed to the Borerna volume. Rather, I would uh, uh, raise a few points about the historiography of East Central Europe and how I think that the major works of Istvan that were never about the region as a synthetic work, but rather certain aspects or certain specific uh, uh, countries uh, like the Lofu Revolution somehow relate to uh, or tell something about what kind of East Central European history we can think about as well. Uh, and let me start with what I will present today uh, in a rather unnuanced way as the basic or the classic way of writing East Central European history, uh, just to uh, quote a recent title from People's Intonations, that's the center, history of East Central Europe, that's practically the history of nations that are coming into being. Modern East Central Europe is about national histories, and that was quite clear for Istvan as well. But I am try to uh, think about, in this short presentation, is more about how the, his works relates to this kind of history, directly or indirectly. One thing that, again, uh, was often mentioned is how much he focused on human stories, anecdotal stories. And this is, I think, uh, in a sense, an essentially subversive way of, uh, for the national history to think about, talk about, 
present history. Because at one point we will come to the uh, moment when we have too many anecdotes to synthesize in a uniform national historical narrative way. These stories, we will always find the exceptions and we will always be uh, uh, urged to explain that expression, uh, exception in a more systematic way than just take it as the exception. From the so this is, I think, in a general way, uh, a kind of subversive approach to any kind of nation history-based East Central European history. And it's also a very contrarian way of writing history. It's kind of the historian Ivan Krastev of that, say. Uh, but I think that, and this is a more important point of this presentation, is that these works are in a very interesting, I would say, meta-historiographic dialogue with this kind of nation history based East Central European history uh, that leads to, uh, for me at least, fascinating conclusion. Uh, and let me give a few examples from the major works, uh, the Lofu Revolution, uh, the Beyond Nationalism, the edited volume on retribution, and the European trial. Uh, how I imagine this kind of meta-historiographic dialogue. Uh, starting with the Lawful Revolution, uh, as I already told, it's as easily familiar, almost canonical, and still different, and Wishman always posited it as a kind of revisionist work, although not all the uh, colleagues were uh, convinced about its revisionist quality. Nevertheless, the most important that even the uh, critical reviews praised was how he uh, created a pantheon or a or a set of protagonists around Kossuth, who was that up to that point, the sole hero of the revolution, uh, who he raised issues of the responsibility of the Hungarian politics for uh, the outbreak of the war, uh, the, the armed conflict with uh, the Viennese uh, court, and also uh, the inevitable defeat of the Hungarians, even without the Russian uh, intervention. That is probably the last bone of contention with Hungarian scholars today, telling something about also how much it's still a kind of revisionist, a contrarian take that Istvan had. Uh, uh, yeah. And this is also, I think, uh, an excursion, a very interesting to think about it, and it was raised yesterday in a discussion by Paul Hannebring, uh, that maybe it is also uh, an interesting sign of how Istvan wrote uh, a part of his scholarship actually as a kind of reaction or reflection on his secondary school way, uh, years in Hungary. So, uh, the Beyond Nationalism on the Habsburg Army uh, is dealing with themes like multi-ethnicity, the social mobility, uh, the, uh, the army of, uh, offered, especially for the jury, but in a sense, just like the uh, Lofu Revolution, it is not written explicitly against the nation or the national, national narrative. Rather, it takes nationality as a legitimate subject and tries to find aspects of history that are non-national beyond the scope of a national interpretation. And it also brings bad news again, at least for Hungarians, that the Habsburg army was not necessarily an oppressive institution. Uh, regarding retributions, uh, and it was explicitly mentioned by Istvan in a interview he gave to the Journal of Imperio. Probably the most important is uh, how history is impossible to translate into something uh, uh, to justice, legal justice, and not independently from the fact uh, how history is continuous. So it's almost impossible to find the point where we can go back to restore something that is fair and just uh, society. And the uh, European trial, which again, like the uh, book edited volume on retribution, uh, has Europe as its scope and not East Central Europe. So brings together the continent that was divided politically and also in scholarship for a long, long uh, time. Uh, takes West and East uh, together. And again, it is the harbinger of bad news. Collaboration was not exceptional. It was general in all over Europe. National histories built on the sole idea of victimhood are problematic. So we can see that, uh, in a sense, it's quite clear that uh, there is a kind of... Uh, this contrarianism is probably very much beyond uh, contrarianism. Uh, and if we want to think about what 
kind of region, East Central Europe, is uh, drawn by these works without having uh, this geographic scope. Uh, one thing is obvious that the region is floating. That's situational, so to say. But, uh, the most important, I think, is how uh, it's uh, how these stories are inherently related to the existence of this national history. It's not a denial of the significance of national history, it's more a kind of dialogue with the national history, offering an alternative history that is still a national history. Uh, juxtaposition of it, or ambiguity of the history, the national history revealed, as Adam Tews uh, uh, mentioned in uh, his talk. Uh, alternative readings that are not taking national history as something that is illegitimate, rather as inherent to the region's history. Uh, it is just uh, beyond the basic national history of East Central Europe, but not beyond the nation. Uh, and let me finish with a kind of speculation. Uh, so it's never really explicit that we should write an East Central European history uh, without national histories. I would even say that somehow this approach implies that we should write an East Central European history that integrates somehow national histories, not necessarily as parallel histories, that is the challenge for historians. But it's also, I think, a very interesting way of leaving to the reader to draw their own conclusions, whether there are more radical conclusions to draw from these kind of contrarian histories regarding how we can imagine a different East Central European histories like any good teacher would do. So, thank you very much. Um, I, I realized something else that I wanted to say in listening to Gabor um, and to also Vicky's uh, reminder that I'm her student, <laughs> uh, is that he did, he did not orientalize East Central Europe in how he taught and how he thought of East Central Europe, it was Europe, and we are going to work on these histories in this room, but we will never forget that these are not the only countries that are of interest, nor the only places where these things have happened, and that we need to think about taking these worlds as seriously as we take other worlds. So instead of making an argument about East Central Europe being more important, it is as important. And that kind of approach allows for a book like Europe on Trial, but it also allows for this once Italianist to be up here, <laughs> someone else's student talking about Ishvan Dea. Um, our next speaker is uh, someone I met my first week, I guess, Rebecca klein Pieshova. She is uh, a professor, associate professor of history and Jewish studies at Purdue University and director of the human rights program there. She specializes in modern East Central European history, devoting special attention to Hungary, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. Intergroup relations and refugee studies. She is the author of Mapping Jewish Loyalties in Interwar Slovakia with Indiana University Press 2015, and chapters appearing in Europe on the Move, Refugees in the Era of the Great War, World War I and the Jews, Conflict and Transformations in Europe, the Middle East, and America, the Holocaust in Hungary, seven years later, and other works. Her chapter, Temporalities of Post-War Jewish Emigration, appears in the forthcoming volume, A Jew in the Street, on the Civic Identity of Modern Jews, published in honor of Michael Stanislavski. Her current book project examines post-war Jewish displacement, dispersion, and diaspora, and she is collaborating with Dr. Lavins uh, and an, on an edited volume about the movement of Jewish people in Judaica across Cold War boundaries. She is co-editor of Shofar, the interdisciplinary journal of Jewish studies. And I also, just before, um, there are two people who I can't think of as different as Ishvan and Rebecca in certain respects. <laughs> both have humor, both are, are, are deeply caring, they think history matters, but, but all of those contra contrarian aspects of Ishvan is definitely not Rebecca. And I think that they, they worked so well together because they both knew about the passion they shared 
to keep the histories of the silenced up front and center. And they did it in different ways in their writing, but their research questions were the same. And I think he had great respect for Rebecca. Um, he showed her a lot of respect vis-a-vis -vis some people who he teased constantly. He did not tease Rebecca. <laughs> so <laughs> please come and share with us. much, Dominique, for that lovely introduction. I also want to mention um, someone who isn't here right now. Um, Iris Rachimimov um, was scheduled to present and um, was not able to be here today. And um, Dominique graciously asked me to step in for her. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm reminded of something that's a little bit influenced by being at Purdue, um, which is you know how uh, the mathematician Andre Erdős, everyone who has an Erdős number, right? And I was thinking maybe we should have a Dayak number, right? It is in, in indicating the amount of distance you have from being a student of, of Erdős and then maybe of, of Dayak. Um, so I also wanted to start in a little bit of a funny way because I know we're the last panel <laughs> and I want to keep your attention going. Um, so I'm starting with reference to the, the title of the piece I put, published in this wonderful journal that, um, that Dominique shepherded us all into uh, for the Journal of Austrian American History. And the title of the piece was D. Fiddler's, T. D. Fiddler on the Roofization. And so I'm starting, what does it mean? This D. Fiddler, roof on, D. Fiddler on the Roofization sounds crazy, no? Um, so... I'm, I'm not going to this whole presentation paraphrase Broadway show lyrics, but I will at the beginning and the end. Um, in any case, um, de fiddler on the roofization is a term that I've been using for years um, as a kind of quirky way to approach the changes of the 90s. As I sometimes tell my students, it was the 90s, man, you know? <laughs> um, so. On a whim, I gave that title to the piece for um, the, the Journal of Austrian American History special issue. Um, and I'm using it again now as a way to center the immediate post-Cold War context um, of a critical mass of Istvan students. And th this is something that Victoria de Grazia mentioned in her introduction to this panel, that there was also a shift in, in Istvan's role in the department and in the, the critical mass of uh, his students um, in that period. So I'd like to talk about that and what it meant for how East Central Europe changed. And then I'll talk um, a bit about the, um, the paradox of Istvan, Istvan's work as I found it, his mentorship and legacy and how that pertains especially to East Central European Jewish history. So, um, for the first part, um, how East Central Europe changed part one. Um, some of you here may remember um, there was a conference at the Harriman Institute in the mid 90s put together by then graduate students, Nigel Rabb and, and Kate Lebov, um, about doing research in Eastern and Central Europe and the former Soviet Union before and after the political changes. And they had uh, professors featured who had done work before the changes um, and after the changes. And um, as I remember, our discussions in that conference came down to the fact of wide-ranging access to the archives after the political changes, um, as opposed to the kind of strategies and working around obstacles to study those materials beforehand the very ability to study those materials in the archives shifted our perceptions of what we studied and the relationships within and between regions. We were, after all, there. We had been able to live and study in the region. We learned, sometimes also say this to students, the, the small languages of the little people in, in East Central Europe, that we're not just studying um, German and Russian and so on, but we're studying those languages. And I, I, I as uh, Victoria de Grazia has just, you know, during this again, I was thinking of, about um, how um, we moved from thinking about this part of the world as a big gray area um, that had no 
contours that had no distinguishing features if you grew up somewhere else than in the region, um, and how we had become used to talking in abstractions and stereotypes um, and distance and romanticization and nostalgic terms. Um, that's the fiddler on the roof scenario. So we move into the 90s and we have this de fiddler on the roofization. Um, so beyond access to the archives, Istvan's students under his mentorship became disabused, this is our favorite Columbia word, um, not abused, but disabused. <laughs> um, we became disabused of long-standing ideologies, nostalgic and abstracted preconceptions, and the narrow national focus that had long shaped histories of this region. Yet there was more. Um, I'd been strongly influenced by Bulgarian writer um, Georgi Gospodinov's extraordinary book, Time Shelter. Um, and I feel that he captures that 90s moment in a, its feel and contours in a way that I've found missing recently. And I think it's important for understanding the changes in the historiography that's part of Istvan's legacy. I'm going to quote here, somewhere there, at the very end of the century, Gospodinov writes, everyone was, we were, young for the last time. Finally, the unhappened seemed as if it was happened. <laughs> Everything was ahead of us. Everything was beginning, right? At the very end of the century, no less. That is, now I stop quoting, um, I'm gaining control of myself. Um, that is, we must recall not only the terrible violence and the difficult transitions of the 90s, but also the promise. If we forget that promise, we cannot come to terms with the changes in our understanding of that historical period. That's our lived experience. Now I'm going to paraphrase um, Rock Stergar, um, who put in a recent humorous and poignant aside um, while praising <laughs> Natasha's book, he said, being from the region means outliving states and state systems. But I'll also add that it means the promise of change, the will to rebuild. It also means resignation. It also means perseverance. It also means pain. I jumped. Gospodinov continued in describing his participation in the demonstrations of 1989. I shouted, I cried, and then suddenly got old in the bait and switch of the following years. We are, I think it's fair to say, beyond the bait and switch years. At some point in the 2010s, possibly in New Orleans at ACES, uh, over coffee with Konstantin Yordaki, we realized that our formative experiences had been the exception to the rule. Yet those exceptions have formed a major stream in our cohort's historiography of East Central Europe. I believe this is something, too, that we need to think about. Istvan was fond of asking his students during Habsburg field prep conversations whether they thought the field was nostalgic. And also, do you think I am nostalgic? <laughs> Um, and I think now we have to hold that question up to ourselves, um, given our experiences and the way we've understood the exceptional period of the 90s. You know, to what extent does the nostalgia and the dream and the promise feed into the way we read the sources? How East Central Europe Changed Part Two, The Paradox. I'm going to shift gears to East Central European Jewish history. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how Istvan's work presents a paradox. We've talked about how he elevates the human story and the, the subversive and revisionist aspect of that focus. Um, he elevates that deeply human approach that centers individual people and their choices and how they move through a broader geopolitics from which they cannot escape. He shows us how unpredictable events and contingencies combined with long-held patterns of behavior 
shape and constrain our action. Ishvan has taught us to center how regular people navigate improbable histories as they seek to be true to themselves. On the other hand, <laughs> um, Ishvan preoccupied his career with the study of what holds states together rather than what pulls them apart. For Austria-Hungary, this meant above all the aristocracy, the Catholic Church, and the civil service. The elites of institutions that glued the disparate state together, it also arguably meant the Jewish population. Jews became important for cohesion as a, quote, state peoples, Staatsvolk, for state building and state maintenance, for their assimilation to usefulness as defined by the dominant state power, an assimilation that ultimately failed. Istvan's work underscores the significance of Austria-Hungary's centripetal institutions, which strove to overcome widespread everyday national social tensions within the state and instill dynastic loyalty within its population. It had been the aspiration of the Habsburg state to cultivate the loyalty of its citizens beyond nationalism. Istvan showed us how fateful shifts in the nature and function of state loyalty could be. Those shifts were especially fateful for Jews. Istvan designates the Jews as the, quote, ultimate victims of the dissolution of the Habsburg monarchy. The supportive role of the Jewish population as a state people in Austria-Hungary, and then the difficult and tragic relations the Jews had with the successor states emerge in much of the East Central European Jewish history writing influenced by Istvan's approach. The state looked toward how Jews, grateful for emancipation without a homeland of their own within the monarchy, could be economically, politically, and militarily useful. For this reason, the Jews in the story tend to be, quote, our Jews, vested in the state, loyal to it, and above all, advantageous to whoever was dominant within it. The most difficult aspect of the story of the Jews as Staatsvolk, for me, has been how that role turned the Jewish population into a proxy for the Kingdom of Hungary's repressive nationality policies. Istvan underscores the importance of the special relationship between the Hungarian ruling gentry and the, quote, enlightened, educated, patriotic segment of the Jews for a division of labor in modernizing Hungary. The focus here is on the assimilated, patriotic Hungarian Jewish elite, which intermarried, converted, rose in commerce, the free professions, the state service, the judiciary, changed their names, uh, even the prestigious elite officer corps. The other Hungarian Jews, including my ancestors, the Kleins, <laughs> the Kleins, don't know how they got to New York eventually, but. The Kleins, the regular, traditional, or even Hasidic ones, are not part of this assimilationist story. Of course, Jews in pre-World War I Hungary, with scant exceptions, declared Hungarian Magyar as their mother tongue on the census, whether or not they undertook other forms of assimilation. My Kleins emigrated to New York before World War I, for which I'm grateful from a place my great-grandfather recorded as Hungary on the 1910 census, in the U.S. Census, <laughs> you know, writing from wherever it was, <laughs> but then as Czechoslovakia in 1920. If they had stayed, our Hungarian Jewish story most likely would have ended in 1944, and not in the shell of a once grand bourgeois apartment in Budapest generations on. And now comes my chance to change the mood a little bit and, <laughs> and conclude with some more paraphrased Broadway show lyrics. Right. So Istvan taught us to be honest, human, and true to ourselves as we bring our improbable lived experience into all of our endeavors. We are here now, um, all of us, with the passing of time and our experience with the bait and switch years as we continue to keep our balance while scratching out our work on East Central European history, like a, <laughs> like a fiddler on the road.
Now do you see why I didn't tease her? Okay, I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to make a joke, <laughs> because I think this is so hilarious. Our next speaker is Rob Nemish. Rob Nemish is a Charles A. Dana Professor of History at Colgate University. He's written The Once and Future Budapest and Another Hungary. <laughs> Everybody else has a paragraph or two. <laughs> now, I, it, this is, no, 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 no. <laughs> if you want, what is this day? In some ways, all of these characters, every single human being who is talking is so different. Every single one of them has a different sense of humor, how they present themselves, what they do with their work, what they think is interesting, and yet they all came together, worked with this one man, and also found a way to be connected amongst each other. It is hilarious. When I read this, I was giggling <laughs> like a schoolgirl because of the difference. Rob, come up here. I won't embarrass you anymore. <laughs> All right, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. So my, I am married to an art historian, and um, early in our marriage, is that okay? Early in our marriage, she came to uh, a talk where I was reading a paper, and so I read the paper, and then afterwards I went up to her and I said, well, what'd you think? There was a pause, and she said, you could use images. <laughs> So since then, I have learned to use images in my presentation and sort of maybe compensate for other shortcomings. Um, this is, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, to be here with friends and in the room with historians whose work I admire and have learned so much from. Um, I struggled a little bit to thinking about what I wanted to say today and what I wanted to write about Ishvan um, this past year in part because I do 19th century Hungary, something a field Ishvan has written a lot about. I feel like I've sort of absorbed and taken in his work so much and have trouble getting the kind of critical distance that I think we've heard in um, Gabor's uh, presentation, for example. Um, so I ended up doing something which is much more personal. It is archival, but it is uh, very personal. And I want to thank Dominique for encouraging me or allowing me to uh, do this. Um, <clears throat> I will, this is mainly about Hungary, as you can see, and about Ishvan's teaching, but I promise to mention East, Europe, East Central Europe at least once. All right, I still have my <clears throat> notes from History of Hungary, 1848 to the present, a course I took 30 years ago with Ishvan Deak. If you look carefully, you can see the accents he added in the top left, as well as the name of the, name of the bright-eyed, all-knowing teaching assistant I wrote below that. <laughs> Dan, Dan Yudovsky, my friends. <clears throat> After entering the PhD program at Columbia, I had become fascinated with Hungary, which I had first visited the summer before, just my second time in Europe. I had also begun studying Hungarian, so I had high expectations for this course. If I am being completely, brutally honest, and this is a reflection of my own limitations, not Ishvan's, I would say that as the semester un unfolded, I felt somewhat underwhelmed. True, Ishvan could rat rattle off and me from memory the names of all the ministers in the 1848 revolutionary government, but one can applaud a long, parade of names and dates for only so long. In my eyes, the teaching was solid, but not spectacular, informative, but not enthralling. So it had seemed at the time. Perhaps it was the room, a windowless, gloomy dungeon in the depths of the International Affairs Building, or the late afternoon meeting time, or Ishvan's health, which was not perfect that semester. Looking back now, I can see how many misapprehensions I had at the time about what constitutes good teaching, about the questions historians should ask. And this last, barely acknowledged and yet very clear, 
about whether I, with my limited horizons and rudimentary language skills, really belonged at Columbia. Today, paging through my class notes, I really realize how deeply mistaken I was, both about Ishvan's gifts as a teacher and due to his generosity and patience about my place in graduate school. These are some of my notes. So, <laughs> Ishvan's approach, my notes confirm that Ishvan's approach to Hungarian history was conventional in many respects. He told the story from the center and from above with a strong emphasis on political, diplomatic, and military history. Now, I can spot the many places in the course where he confidently plunged into long-running historical debates, such as those surrounding the Hungarian Declaration of Independence, was it a mistake? Or the 1867 settlement, it worked, shout my notes. Ishvan displayed his characteristic affinity for individuals and behaviors that defy simple characterization, such as the Honved General Karoj Leinigen uh, Westerberg, who came from an aristocratic German family, married a Hungarian noblewoman, and had a brother and uncle who fought for the Habsburgs, and yet was executed in Arad in 1849. Ishvan also offered broader interpretations. The first day of class, I wrote, Quote, the gradual disappearance of the minorities is the most important transformation in Eastern Europe. A marginal note scrawled on the second day of class, ethnicity, not the 18th, 19th century problem, posed a riddle that I and many other people would try to answer in the decades to come. Ishvan's presentation of the 20th century offered important lessons uh, for the study of Hungarian and the East European region. He showed that, uh, he showed how compare, oh, sorry, I wanna go ahead. He showed how comparative history, one embracing all of Europe, could illuminate the many dilemmas people faced in Nazi-dominated Europe, as this quotation linking France, Hungary, and Bulgaria shows. Yet, as many people, others ha have noted, my notes show also, also show how deeply he understood the need for clarity and, multiple, and moral purpose in teaching and writing about this history. The quotation there, the deportion, deportation of Hungarian Jews, the greatest tragedy in the history of Hungary, I think speaks directly to this. Ishvan's treatment of communism and the 1956 revolutions were insightful and nuanced. When, and this is tough to uh, relive, when on one of my papers, I accidentally wrote Rakosi, the Hungarian Stalinist. When I meant to write Rakotsi, Rakotsi, the Hungarian freedom fighter of the 18th, fighter of the 18th century, Ishvan simply corrected the mistake and added a humorous exclamation point in the margins. Only later did it dawn on me, thick-skulled as I was, that Rakoshi had been one of the main reasons that Ishvan had left Hungary. In class, Ishvan spoke very little about the diff how, how this difficult history had affected him, his family, and his friends. In one class, when he passed around an English language book by the historian Joseph Held, I noted another Hungarian exile. I noted the Hungarian le language dedication, Pistanak. Barati Seretetel Yoshka. Marveling at its economy, in Hungarian this conveys a lot, and wondering at its many layers of meaning. My class notes contained a cryptic remark, completely cryptic to me until very recently. Scrawled on the top of a page outlining the cause of the 1848 revolution, Kurush Nag Harshan, town where Deok's parents were exiled. I, I now know that this occurred in the 1950s and that this, village, this refers to a small village in the Hungarian-Romanian border. But nothing in my notes or my memories gives any indication how this came up or what it meant to Ishvan. Only later would he begin to write and speak publicly about growing up in Hungary in the 1930s and 40s. I would instead get to know Ishvan in many other ways. When I plunged headfirst into Hungarian history, somewhat uncertainly, 
and chose to write a dissertation about the Reform era. Uh, he gave his full support and answered countless questions as I tried to get my bearings. Although he had cares and concerns of his own, he was always patient, generous, kind, and funny. Admirable skills and a dissertation advisor. These qualities were needed at the end of my graduate career, at my dissertation defense. Ishvan's legs had <clears throat> been troubling him. And as the date approached, it was clear that Ishvan, that the defense would have to be held in his apartment on Riverside Drive. The morning of the defense, however, I received a phone call. Robert. <laughs> it was Ishvan. Ishvan informed me that his legs were so bad that he would not be able to get out of bed and also asked me to get bagels. <laughs> so I spent 20 minutes before my dissertation of defense in this panic, running up and down Broadway, trying to get decent bagels, cream cheese, orange juice. I'm past that. My dissertation defense thus took place in his bedroom, with his, him propped up on pillows, and the rest of the committee and I sitting in chairs around his bed. What might have been strange or awkward became, because of Ishvan, entirely because of Ishvan, a moment of friendship and humor, as well as difficult questions about my dissertation. Sixteen years later, I read with pride and deep feeling the dedication he had written in my copy of Europe on Trial to Robert Nemesh, fellow Hungarian historian, in memory of our bedroom PhD defense, Ishvan mm -hmm. Dale. Thank you. So um, there's a reason he doesn't need a big introduction. He's got the body to, of the work. He, would, he doesn't need us to have all these compliments to him. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, our last speaker today before our big keynote finale is uh, Natasha Wheatley. Her book just came out uh, a month ago, yes, <laughs> The Life and Death of States. Um, in many ways, she is, although she was not a student of Ishvan, she is the end of an era of Central Europeanists at Columbia, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong. Um, and she, she's part of the family. <laughs> it, this is a constantly growing thing, not just of students, of, of former students that wasn't former students, but of this inclusivity and culture where we can all disagree about, about arguments, but we also all know why we're doing this. And I'm so happy that she agreed to join us. I don't think it's very easy to be sitting up here with, after seeing Rob's uh, beautiful uh, PhD bedroom defense. So anyways, a little bit about Natasha. She's assistant professor in, in the Department of History at Princeton University with broad interests in modern European and international history. Her book, The Life and Death of States, Central Europe and the Transformation of Modern Sovereignty was published by Princeton University Press in June 2023. Her writing has appeared in Past and Present, Law and History Review, History and Theory, Slavic Review, and the London Review of Books, among many other places. Natasha, please end us. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you again to Dominique. Uh, as, as everyone has noted, uh, her energy in, in, in keeping this field together and building our community is just unparalleled. And I'm, like so many others, so grateful to her. Uh, so I arrived uh, to start a PhD here at Columbia in 2008, so long after the DEAC teaching era. Um, but Derek was a very vivid presence still. Um, and in fact, that whole generation was in, in a way that I can now see really was the end of an era. So uh, Dayak, Fritz Stern, Robert Paxton, they would all kind of turn up to the departmental sort of parties and events. I ended up working for Fritz Stern as an assistant. And 
whether it was admiring the incredible sort of Art Nouveau furniture in his place that had come from Breslau, right, that, that his parents had had made, you know, uh, or whether it was, yeah, in, in um, Day X Manors there, if you were at his place for tea, the trays, the flowers, you know, that, 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 that accompanied uh, the serving of tea and cake. You, you sensed you had this living connection to the Europe that you were studying. They were like these embodied threads to that mid-century world. And um, especially as a kind of, I don't know, self-hating Australian who'd been obsessed with Europe as long as I could remember, this was, it was almost like anthropological. You know, you, you got to, to be in that world in, in a very real way. Um, and I enjoyed it so much. But it wasn't just the lingering kind of embodied presence of these figures. There, there was a, an intellectual way, too, in which my time here was very much shaped um, by, by Dayak. So um, when I was here, uh, the East Central European grad class was being taught by Deborah Cohen, Debbie Cohen, who many of you may know, a very um, wonderful historian of science who was at Barnard. And so it was my first semester of graduate school that I took um, her class. Um, and she structured it as a kind of history of the field, too. I mean, she had that insight that you can't just sort of almost launch into the current state of things. And that, so you... So students have to understand how we got to where we are. So I remember in the first week we read A.G.P. Taylor's, um, you know, you know, book on the on the Asteroid Empire, which is just you know, shocking at kind of every turn, you know. But she then it worked so well as a pedagogical device because she then moved from that to sort of the the interpretations that now characterise our field. And so we understood why those critiques had been so powerful because we, we knew um, what they were critiquing. And, you know, Dayak's work, like we read, you know, that famous comment from, the, from 1966 in which he kind of just blasts open the field. But then, of course, also um, the book about the Habsburg Officer Corps. And, you know, thinking back, it was just sort of reflected as, well, the truth. You know, this was where the field was now. This was the state. This, is, this was the world in which we all lived intellectually. And that... I never, you know, in some ways unpacked that. That was just the sense, it was the truth, you know. Uh, and so we lived in the kind of long scholarly present shaped by his work. And, and I think, you know, we're still in that, uh, you know, with good reason. So um, being conscious of that legacy here, even though I hadn't had that much to do with him, I was, you know, very um, keen to attend this AHA panel that, that Peter and Dominique put together a few years ago. It was in the middle of COVID, and it was a, a, a panel um, celebrating uh, Dayak. And I'm, I'm so glad we did that, right? Because it's so unfortunate if these things only happen after people have gone, you know, and, and it was very powerful and moving. He was there, you know, it was all on Zoom. Um, and in the course of that event, Atina Grossman was there too, who'd also worked with him, and she mentioned in one of her comments how Dayak's early book on Weimar intellectuals had completely shaped and started her career and given her the questions that she then took into subsequent work. And I was like, Weimar intellectuals? Ishvan Dayak? Is this the same person? I mean, just out of my naivety, I had no idea. Like, I knew him as a Habsburg, you know, a story. And so after that panel, I just went straight away and, and hunted down this book, uh, his first book. You know, it's not super easy to get anymore. Uh, and I, I thought it was worth coming back to today because there in the preface, he explains his road into a scholarly career, right? The questions that first drove him in graduate study. So here he writes, this book is due to a youthful fascination with the writers, poets, and dramatists of my native Hungary, some of, whom, some of whom made political history. Ever since the late 18th century, Hungarian intellectuals molded public opinion, launched new political movements, and alternately, bol alternately bolstered and undermined the existing government. All this was taken for granted by Hungarians. If the country's professional politicians were traditionally short-sighted and ruthless, True leadership rightfully belonged to the more imaginative and graceful literati. I'm skipping some. As an adult, I came to recognize the heavy debt that Hungarian literati owed to the men of ideas abroad. Just as the previous generation had looked to Paris for inspiration, the Hungarian intellectuals of the interwar period, whether communists, democrats, populists, or conservative revolutionaries or fascists, looked to Berlin. But the German intellectuals to whom I inevitably turned proved to have had neither power nor influence in their political world. In the 20th century um, Hungary, the literati were at least partly responsible for two revolutions, those of 1918, 1919, and 1956, and for the political and social ferment of, the, of other years. Their brilliant German counterparts achieved almost nothing. 
And he sets that up as this central paradox then, how to understand these uh, more brilliant uh, German scholars who nevertheless had sort of no impact uh, in the world uh, that they uh, were working in. Uh, so it's a book about ideas, but it's also crucially about the public and political role of the intellectual, right? About um, their relationship to politics, their efficacy in the world, their social setting, and the way in which these ideas were activated at and by different political conjunctures. Now, of course, this interest feels extraordinarily contemporary, contemporary right now, right? Where we think a lot about um, the powerlessness of a lot of scholarship in the world, but we're also in a moment in which um, you could say the influence of ac academic ideas is overstated by the right, right? If we think about anti-gender theory marches in France where they're burning effigies of Judith Butler or the, the critical race studies uh, uh, hysteria and a lot of right-wing public debate as well. So this, this question of when ideas are powerful and when they're not, you know, is something we can, uh, I think, historicize in different um, ways for different moments. But I was thinking about this today, about the fact that the public role of the intellectual stood at the inception of his scholarly career, um, because there's this fascinating odd loop to life and work, right? Because, of course, that is, of course, exactly what Dayak himself became. In the 1980s and 1990s, he became the writer and reviewer of choice on Central and Eastern Europe, for the New York Review of Books and the New Republic. And it's worth reflecting uh, on this, I think, because this dimension of life isn't explicitly centered in our program, although it's come up indirectly in a number of the different talks, because it's in this format, right, in, of the format of the review essay, uh, that his interpretations and words would have reached by far their largest audience. As you know, many of the pieces were later collected into the volume Essays on Hitler's Europe of 2001, and in the preface there, he describes how it all came about. How the legendary editor, Robert Silvers, had, circa 1980, asked him to write a piece about a new book on the, 1940, sorry, on the 1848 revolutions in Europe. This was, of course, Alan Sked's Radetzky book, The Survival of the Habsburg Empire. The review appeared in February 1981. Now, it's not hard to see uh, why he was asked. His own book on the 48 revolutions, The Lawful Revolution, had come out just two years before. So this was squarely in his ballywick. But something curious then happened. Silvers clearly liked his writing and started sending him other sorts of commissions, moving deep into the 20th century and coming to focus overwhelmingly on the Second World War and the Holocaust. Now, Silvers taught Dayak much about writing. The titanic struggles between the two over sentences, words, and phrases have already been mentioned here today. But Silvers also had a pronounced effect on the objects of Dayak's attention. As Dayak himself wrote, it is through association with him that I have retrained myself as an historian of the tragic, yet ultimately hopeful events of World War II, unquote. So it's fascinating, right? If, if institutional contingencies here at Columbia nudged him first from German to Habsburg history, these other contingencies now directed him back to German history. And one can't help here but be reminded of, of, of Dayak's own persistent sensitivity uh, to the contingent, constrained circumstances that shape the lives of others. But stepping back, I think it's interesting to reflect on this timing. This is the 1980s and 1990s. That is really in the thick of that serious surge of public Holocaust consciousness in the public sphere. These topics lay at the very center of a broader moral debate. In the academy too, these fields had huge moral urgency, high stakes, and broad influence in other fields and methodological uh, debates. And the New York Review of Books was, of course, one of the central organs of this world of Belle uh, in one of the centers of the world. So how remarkable and also how wonderful that Dayak somewhat accidentally became the key public interpreter of the new scholarship in this area, the public voice of such significant public reckoning with the shadow lands of human morality. All the major topics and scholars passed through the discerning sieve of his assessment. In the piece, How Guilty Were the Germans, of May 1984, he reviewed Tom Childers, Ian Kershaw, Volker Burkhan, and many others. In The Incomprehensible Holocaust of September 89, he reviewed Arno Meyer's Why Did the Heavens Not Darken, Tom Segev's Soldiers of Evil, Francois Furet's Unanswered Questions, and Zygmunt Bauman's Modernity in the Holocaust. In Witnesses to Evil of October 92, he brought the new literature on perpetrators and bystanders to the public. He wrote about Jan Gross's Neighbours in Heroes and Victims of 2001, about Goldhagen in December 02, Christopher Browning in September 04. 
So this is Dayak as a practitioner, not only of social, political history and institutional history, but also I think of a kind of moral history, one profoundly interested in moral judgment and ethical life, in moral culpability, as uh, Jennifer put it uh, in her piece uh, in the special issue. We need only cast our eyes down some of the other titles of that. I kind of went through the archive there in the New York Review of Books, kind of surveying them. And these titles are like Misjudgment at Nuremberg, Heroism in Hell, Who Saved the Jews, Memories of Hell, The Pope, the Nazis and the Jews, and so on and so forth. Reading the pieces now, I am struck by the way he reasons through these debates and often decides on them in a certain sense, right? He weighs questions and offers a sort of moral conclusion or at least some ethical guidance to the reader. He seems more comfortable doing that than many of us might be now, or perhaps than we are trained to be. To be sure, his moral assessments are often characterized by the paradoxical or the and then formulations we've discussed earlier today. For example, he did not think it was fair to call Germans willing executioners, yet nor was it fair to lay the blame all at the top of the Nazi leadership. But still, he offers his reasons, reasoned, balanced moral assessment. If we might describe this style of historical reasoning as moral history, it is not, I don't think, a history of morals in the way that some people are doing now by, say, tracing our shifting moral horizons and values and subjectivities, for example, in the history of humanitarianism or the history of human rights. Dayak's history, by contrast, is characterized by a kind of constancy of morals. Now, he's infinitely attuned to the difficult circumstances in which people make ethical decisions. He is never polemical and always profoundly empathetic. But there is some constancy to the core of things, something stable deep inside us that allows us, maybe even compels us, to think ethically between and across cases and circumstances. It's connected to what has been described as his humanism, his objectivity, and I think what Paul mentioned earlier about the way he thought empirically rather than conceptually or structurally. This is moral thinking that is close to the ground in a very profoundly ethical way. The people are always the actors, as many today have noted, making ethical decisions in the same way that we do now. There is, to be sure, a connection between this style of reasoning and the needs and prerogatives of public history writing. I think morality is a big feature of why the general public are interested in history and how they relate to it. But there is a larger, deeper point and talent here, too. Just as the extraordinary simplicity and nakedness of Dayak's prose belies the complexity of the material discussed and the effort involved in crafting it, so Dayak's seemingly untheorized or common sense ethical sensibility belies the powerful, delicate tightrope walk that underlies it. I would describe it thus to hold aloft a universalism and a contextualism at the same time. Here, ethical human life is always situated and transcendent simultaneously. That duality surges out through his work with a, as a kind of overwhelming imperative, an imperative that is not, I don't think, difficult to anchor in his own biography. And I'd like to finish with Dayek's own conclusion to his volume of these essays on Hitler's Europe. So these are the, the words that, with which he ends the sort of preface or introduction to his kind of uh, synthetic statement um, about those topics. As for myself, I have lived with these thoughts and dilemmas for many, many years. Though only a teenager, I was there when these dramatic events took place. Even today, the memories are enough to spoil one's sleep. A part of me just wants to stop there because that was so beautiful. Um, and I also just want to say three things. I want to thank Al Rakov, I want to thank Eileen Hun, and I want to thank every single presenter here for so much amazing work. No one came up here and just winged it. <laughs> There's care is one of the most beautiful things we can do. It's constructive, it's it's artistic, it's belle lettre, um, and it's, it's been beautiful being here with you today. I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts about what has been, uh, been brought forward. We have, um, we have 
So many wonderful, smart minds in this room. Does anyone have any reactions that they want to share? Or maybe from the table itself? Da, na, 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 na. There's someone here. Yes. So he's asking about um, a factory on Chapel Island. Uh, and if anyone has any information on that, uh, then you should probably share it with him because he needs to know. <laughs> but you're right to ask. This is a room of experts. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I was wondering if any of the graduate students in the room have any thoughts that they want to share or question. Yeah, we do have some graduate students. If not, that's fine. Rebecca? Yeah, I had a thought. Um, when Robert, when you were showing the syllabus, I remembered when I took a class with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't completely remember all the context. For some reason, um, talk closer were, to the oh, You were teaching the class, it was about Central Europe, something like uh, it was early modern through modern. Period, and we, we did a lot of art. Yes. And I wondered if you could tell a little bit more about the context of that class. It, it was really beautiful and really helped me understand the early modern period in a way that I had. Sure, I'd be happy to say a few words. This was a class, title eludes me now, but it was on Central Europe 1526 to uh, uh, 1790, perhaps, and I really have not taught that material since. I, at the time, I learned so much about the Thirty Years' War and um, Maximilian and the Habsburgs, and yeah, there's amazing art on that. Read everything by R. J. W. Evans, and I do think this is one thing that's interesting for me as someone who's been teaching around this area for a while is how I tend to keep getting pushed forward a little bit in my teaching and what seems to be interesting and where the you know, big debates are. And, and Ishvan's own work sort of moved in, you know, from the 19th to the 20th century. And when I teach, I tend to move up to the present, if anything, and not back to this earlier period. So I have these hazy but very positive memories of teaching that and in some ways wish to go back to that. But that's nice you bring that up. Thanks. Um, yes. I'll, I'll repeat it out loud. Oh, I think this is working now. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Małgorzata Mazurek. I'm teaching here uh, at Columbia History Department, uh, History of Poland and uh, Eastern Europe. And, um, you know, I, I've met uh, Istvan Deak several times, you know, when I came here to New York in 2012, and then when uh, also was in his apartment eating um, uh, some fantastic uh, Hungarian food at his place. Um, ordered somewhere from New Jersey and uh, it was pork, for sure. <laughs> Definitely not kosher. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I would like to ask about things that you were discussing about nostalgia and urgency and East Central Europe as an idea that you need to really lay it out, but also intellectually, but also engage with it, um, uh, you know, publicly or in a moral even sense, as, as Natasha Whitley has mentioned. And, you know, I was, I'm, I'm teaching um, courses on, on, on the topics related, and I think about Istvan uh, legacy, you know, the social history of the military, empire, nation building, uh, retributive justice, um, and sort of 20th century, the century of extremes versus 19th century, etc. cetera. And, um, and I really wonder what Istvan Dark would say today about you know, the, the, the moment, the predicament of Eastern Europe today, uh, because I think we are in a very non-nostalgic moment. Uh, and you have really thousands of people of my generation, younger generation, being killed, many historians, many intellectuals, 
in Ukraine. And I, you know, and I wonder, there are all these topics that Istvan worked on that would so much refer to today's situation. And I, you know, and I, I feel too, you know, uninformed to, to make a statement of what we, he would have said. But I'm very curious about your... Uh, I'm uh, also in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm looking at <laughs> Hungarian colleagues also on, you know, things happening uh, politically in, in Eastern Europe, uh, from, from Orban to Paul exit, <laughs> you know, perhaps looming. So, so, yeah, if you could say something about sort of beyond nostalgia, <laughs> uh, although it may be a difficult moment, but I just think that it's something to, uh, important to address. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is a tough one. Um, okay. Um, you know, I I do think that in in moving beyond nostalgia, we need to hold on to that human element, we have to look at what is, what is happening on, thank you, <laughs> notoriously soft voiced, um, thinking about what, what is happening on the ground right now. I don't know, particularly with reference to Ukraine, whether we can totally move beyond nostalgia because there's something, uh, there's a, a kernel in nostalgia that helps keep people's morale. Um, there's also moving beyond it and in, in thinking of what kind of relationships can we form now to move beyond this very difficult moment. Um, how can we help each other? Um, I'm currently dealing with um, we're dealing with. I'm, I'm involved actively with a group of um, Ukrainian visiting scholars on campus at Purdue. It's uh, there's a group of 13 scholars now who are supported by the university, and all of them come from different regions of Ukraine and have different political affiliations, but recognize that they form a community and they've created a kind of special community um, to help them, one, get through this because, of course, when you're in a difficult moment, you have to, you have to pull yourself together and move through it. I mean, you don't have that much opportunity. For it. But also to find the elements and the, the linkages between them that will help them move toward the reconstruction and create a country that they want to create. But I've also seen rifts in that community um, and where we, we have a, a, a failure of those um, symbolic connections. Um, so they, in, in this case, it's, it's perhaps not as much a, a nostalgia as a, a future nostalgia you know, what, what, how do we imagine, how can we be nostalgic for a future we want to have? And how do we create that future? We, we jump, we shout in the street. And how are we going to make it without all the bait and switch and um, but as for the, the nostalgia, I think it's really crucial in moving beyond nostalgia to recognize um, something that that I'm just coming to terms with um, through reading the the special issue of the journal and, and thinking about all of this preparing for this event that we have to recognize that this critical mass of Deoc students come from an exceptional period in history where there was the the, the needle pointed toward promise and exception and that's not you know I told my parents, don't worry about anti-Semitism. You know, I'm, I'm going, it's 1993, I'm going to Budapest, it's going to be fine, everything's different now. I, I was 23. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And I think we, we need to be cognizant that much of the way we filter through the information has to do with our free travel, our ability to be there, um, our experience of the region, our networks of colleagues that we were able to create from that time um, and build on those but realize that we had to overcome a lot to get there and those tensions exist and they existed previously. Um, and I, I know this is a kind of, uh, you know, being controversial here and in, in talking, nope. <laughs> Um, I'm not in the national indifference camp. <laughs> you know, I, I do think, especially for Jews, it comes out over and over again that you, you, you could not be. Nobody's going to accept that from you. And you're going to pay for it in every turn from each group. So you just have to be yourself and move forward as you think is best so you can sleep at night. And I'm taking up too much. But maybe Gabor, do you want to add anything? I'm certainly not qualified to uh, make a statement in Istvan's name. Uh, and I'm not saying it uh, cynically. It's just what's clear from his public engagement with uh, Hungarian politics of memory that he relatively actively did for a very long time. Uh, and even more intensely after uh, Viktor Orban came to power the second time and Peter Pastor uh, talked about it, I mean, the, the, the secrets of, of it as well. Uh, but it came out also from uh, other presentations that uh, something that I, I think I must say self-critically, uh, he understood better, and it's probably the, his own history, biography, and how he came to working on history. The power of history uh, within society. And that was one of the illusions of, I think, the post-change of regime period, also theorized within history and fascination with deconstruction, postmodern. That uh, also gave historians in Hungary certainly a kind of uh, absolution for not engaging with the public or engaging in a very selective way with the public, a depoliticized way, making depoliticized history a virtue uh, and not thinking about the dangers of it, uh, not thinking about why, not trying to find a way of being reflexive and critical about, because that was one of the reasons of this depoliticization of uh, how we think about the original 19th century role of historians in nation building and all the problems that come with it and later the politicization of historiography by uh, post authoritarian uh, dictatorship. You know, so uh, that it's, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, our own interpretation of the historian's role in society describes well what, how we can influence society. And one of the, one of, I think, the most important uh, failures to recognize was that just because we thought that we have the authority, so we can keep the authority from the 19th century without actually playing that kind of public role. So we thought that the historian through the idea of historical truths, could actually impose his own view on society. And we learned in Hungary, certainly, that it doesn't work that way. It's challenged from many uh, corners, and uh, the most painful is probably not when it's a well-founded, government-friendly institute that does it, but when practically uh, laymen publishing on, at their own cost and sold very well uh, on the streets. So this is... Rob, do you want to add anything? I think that um, I think that what he thought, and this again, I'm not speaking in his name, is um, if you write so people who shouldn't know could know, there's hope. 
to break the trap of, of state narratives that condone violence. I think that his writing was his politics in terms of why do history, be, because history is being used. So if historians don't try to be useful, <laughs> legible, engaged, then what's the point? It's giving up. That's just my impression, but I don't know if that would be what other people see. Yes, please. And introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Peter Pastor, I presented this morning. I guess uh, I may be the oldest person who knew Istvan, and I used to visit him in his office in the late 60s when I was working on my dissertation, Hungary between Wilson and Lenin. And I used to, uh, I wrote my dissertation at NYU, but I was more on this campus than at NYU because of the library and the archival material. And uh, I used to visit him in his office. And next to his office was the office of Tibor Halashi Kuhn, who was a linguist. And uh, whenever I visited, we were talking about him with Istvan. He was very proud of his colleague and friend uh, because Halashi Kuhn uh, finished, got his PhD, according to Istvan, uh, in Budapest when he was 16 years old. Uh, and uh, according to Istvan, uh, it was Halashi Kuhn who suggested that the East Central European program should be named uh, Institute on East Central Europe, and he then, of course, Ishman became the director of that. And those get-togethers, uh, students and everything were really fun. I used to attend those. And in fact, I remember uh, the one in 1975 uh, on September 12 in the evening. And I remember well because I got married in the afternoon. And I took my new wife and we came uh, to uh, the celebration. And Eva was running under the tables. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, when uh, I told Istvan that uh, we just got married and came to the reception, to the party of the, for students and faculty, uh, he was kind of shocked, taken aback, why are you here? Uh, but then he announced it to the party goers, and uh, it was very much fun to be with him. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leslie Waters. I teach a modern European history at the University of Texas at El Paso, and I wanted to just give a little bit more information about the, uh, the special volume of Hungarian Studies Review that Csaba Bekes mentioned. So that's coming out in December, and we have a round table with contributions from Peter Chundarlik, Chaba Bekes, Robert Nemesh, Howard Lupovich, Attila Polk, Zoltan Saz, and Tibor Haidu. We also are publishing a primary source written by Istvan Dejak, his reports to IREX after his expulsion from Hungary in 1973. Uh, with a uh, scholarly introduction by Sobolc Laszlo and Matthias Duller. So uh, that will be coming out in December. It's actually the 50th anniversary issue of Hungarian Studies Review. We are unfortunately um, not open access, but you can find us on the uh, scholarly publishing collective through Duke University Press. Uh, and if and also all members of Hungarian Studies Association receive a copy of uh, Hungarian Studies Review. So that's coming out soon, thank you. And didn't you just recently publish a book that we should all hear the title of? Yeah, uh, Borders on the Move, uh, Territorial Change and Ethnic Cleansing in the Hungarian-Slovak Borderlands, 1938 to 1948. Yay. <laughs> Should we take a break uh, before we have our final introduction and keynote? All right. It's, uh, we're meeting at 4.30. It's at 4.30.